Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our discussion about U.S.-Saudi relations, and we're going to dig in in this segment into the Saudi relationship with al-Qaeda-type forces, extreme Islamists. And now joining us again from London is Madawi al-Rashid. She's a visiting professor at the Middle East Center at the London School of Economics and Political Science. Her recent publications include A History of Saudi Arabia and A Most Masculine State. Thanks for joining us again, Madawi. Thank you. So I, I mentioned in, in an earlier segment that the Joint Congressional Committee investigating 9-11 had found that the Saudi government was responsible for financing and facilitating the 9-11 attacks. And I interviewed Senator Bob Graham, who was co-chair of that uh, uh, Congressional Investigating Committee, and I asked him why he thought the Saudis had done this. And his answer was that bin Laden had told the uh, Saudi uh, king or the Saudi royal regime that he had 10,000 fighters that he could send to Saudi Arabia to try to develop an uprising against the Saudi uh, royal family if they didn't help him launch these attacks. Uh, I don't know if Bob knows that for sure or not, Bob Graham. Uh, I don't know uh, whether it's true or not true uh, on terms of their motivation, but it is a kind of reflection of this very complicated relationship where on the one hand, Bin Laden's force, you know, when he was alive, certainly seemed to make the Saudi regime his main enemy. If uh, other than perhaps Shia, he talked about the the way the Saudi's royal family had sold out to the uh, Americans and such. On the other hand, there's all kinds of evidence that the Saudis have worked with these forces in Afghanistan and and in many other places. So, wh what is the nature of this relationship? It is a very complex relationship. To begin with, uh, Saudi Arabia wanted to use Islamism in its fight against any external threat that may have an internal um, uh, impact. I'll give you one example. In the 1950s and 60s, Saudi Arabia saw the threat uh, to its uh, uh, regime uh, coming from the uh, leftist movement in the Arab world and also from Arab nationalism. And it used Islamism as a counterforce to actually destroy these two movements. And therefore, it, it sponsored Islamic education, it sponsored Islamic opinions that depict these movements as atheism. And also, uh, uh, during the Cold War, it enlisted its ideology on behalf of the West in order to fight battles elsewhere, uh, such as, for example, in Afghanistan. And therefore, the Saudi Wahhabi dimension of all this Al-Qaeda is extremely important. Although the Saudi regime tries to distance itself from this kind of uh, radicalism. I think it's important, too, uh, that, that the Americans were fully in on this. There's a, a fairly well-known quote from Eisenhower where he says, we, we will use the Saudis' role in defending Mecca to pro help promote them as the defenders of Islam throughout the Muslim world, and they'll help us fight Nasserism and nationalism and socialism. Uh, I may not be quoting it exactly, but I'm pretty close. Yes, absolutely. This was part of the Cold War strategy uh, and Saudi Arabia uh, deployed its ideology and support and also funds in order to fight uh, wars elsewhere. But the problem for Saudi Arabia is when this ideology came back to haunt uh, 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 the country itself, and it is almost like having a battle with your own ideology, and therefore it's very difficult for the Saudis to get rid of this kind of menace. Um, and they haven't learned lessons from 9-11. So if you look at what is going on in Syria now, uh, in Syria they have uh, created, the Saudis have created armed uh, rebels uh, who are actually uh, uh, almost working on behalf of the Saudis in Syria. So the, the Syrian revolution was derailed and uh, lost its democratic uh, slogans. And now it became a sectarian war between different groups, the Shia and the Sunnis. And, and uh, with Saudi intervention, uh, we find that the, uh, the rebels who were promoted were called the Islamic uh, uh, Front. And we have seen how uh, this was unfolding in Syria. Um, until recently, Saudi Arabia allowed uh, uh, its own young men to travel to Syria, or if it didn't allow them, it kept a blind eye. And only recently, just a week before uh, uh, Obama's visit, uh, 
Saudi Arabia introduced this new anti-terrorism law, which says that anybody who goes to Syria and, and come back uh, will be, will face 20 years in prison. And the interesting thing is, uh, yes, uh, we may keep a blind eye uh, on those people going, but we're going to arrest them when they come back. But there was no effort that was uh, obvious to me that they would make sure they do not go there to fight. Uh, well, it may be that the, they're going to make them stay there and fight with a law like that. I think the best thing that Saudi regime can hope for is for them to go and die there. That's, that's sort of what I was uh, saying. Uh, th there seems to have been a change uh, from, the, from the days when the Saudis seemed to be very concerned about attacks on their regime in Saudi Arabia from Al Qaeda forces. There seems to have been a kind of accommodation in some way that now, in fact, it seems that the, the uh, Al Qaeda type forces are almost like part of, a, of the, a w the way the Saudis wage asymmetrical warfare and, and, f and use them in leverage. I mean, the mo obvi most obvious place is uh, in Syria, but you see it in Iraq. But then you see these threats. Uh, you know, I talked about 9-11, but we know about uh, Bandar's threat, Prince Bandar's threat to uh, Tony Blair when there was an inquiry into uh, the bribery scandal. Uh, based on uh, Saudis buying several billion dollars of weapons, and apparently Bandar got a billion dollar bribe, and Bandar says to Blair, uh, you better stop this inquiry, or I can't promise there won't be another 7-7 when the buses blew up in London. And more recently, apparently Bandar threatened Putin and, and, and said, you know, we, we control the Chechen terrorists. Uh, it, it, it seems like it's a lever of power in their hands. Yes, absolutely. And uh, uh, we have seen since 2008, there were no uh, terrorist attacks in Saudi Arabia. They managed to push uh, the Al-Qaeda to Yemen, basically. They haven't destroyed it. They haven't uh, uh, you know, removed it. Uh, they simply had forced it to migrate to Yemen. And a lot of Saudis have left uh, Saudi Arabia to go there. But the, the interesting thing is uh, it has been used uh, as a sort of a, a pressure on uh, foreign governments, meaning that you know you do as we want you to do, or we will not cooperate with you in terms of intelligence cooperation, or we would actually, you know, uh, they wouldn't put it so directly, but you know, it is a subtle hint that uh, uh, when the uh, serious uh, fraud office in Britain wanted to. Uh, open up the Ali Yamama weapons deal and the corruption that was involved with BAE system, uh, the Saudis immediately announced that if this uh, serious fraud investigation goes uh, ahead, they will cease to cooperate with Britain uh, on intelligence, meaning that we will not uh, be able to help you catch the terrorist, basically. Uh, and it is interesting that they may have had a quite a close relationship. They know them uh, so well that they hold information about them that they're only going to release to those intel other intelligence services that cooperate with the Saudis and also uh, in governments that are supposedly friendly governments. Right, and, and the Saudis, one of the intelligence agencies the Saudis cooperate a lot with is the Pakistani ISI. And the Pakistani ISI seems to play the same game and you know, collaborate to some extent with the West in anti-terrorist operations. On the other hand, uh, there's lots of evidence the ISI has all kinds of relationship with the uh, Taliban and, and Al-Qaeda type forces. And in fact, journalists that have reported on this have been assassinated by, by the ISI, including one that worked with us. Yes, I mean, it is the Al-Qaeda monster. It's the monster that was created in, at a particular historical moment and began to haunt all those contributing forces that made it happen and, and allowed it to flourish throughout uh, the last three decades. Uh, and the Saudis had uh, deployed the same strategy in Syria now, uh, whereby uh, individuals can go and join these rebels. Uh, they kept a blind eye for a long time, but then now when international pressure is mounting because they see how uh, these rebels are uh, really not an alternative to Bashar al-Assad, Saudis uh, introduced this uh, new terrorism law in order to deal with this situation. But whether it will actually work, I, I have my doubt. And I guess the Americans have been so part of this policy 
of working with the extreme Islamists. It's hard, it's, they can't say or don't want to say much about it. Yes, I mean, it, it is a, a, a well-known uh, uh, fact now. Uh, you know, the archives are, will be open and uh, declassified information will be available and future historians will probably write incredible books uh, with uh, concrete evidence. Now we get the information from leaked documents or from journalists who are actually in the field uh, at the time and can report on us where the weapons to so-called rebels are coming from and who is sponsoring them. Okay, in the next segment of our interview, we're going to find discuss why Saudi Arabia considers Iran such a mortal enemy. Please join us with Madawi Al-Rashid on The Real News Network.